Hello, all. Um, appreciate you making the time to join us at our first uh, interim since the, uh, ITF, the last ITF, 111. Uh, we have online myself, Lou Berger, Janos Farkas, my co chair, and Ethan Grossman. Uh, as always, we are using uh, collaborative note taking that is in the chat session. Please uh, join us there, both to capture notes as well as to enter your name as part of the blue sheets. This is a formal IETF meeting, which means the IETF. Lou, sorry to interrupt. Should we start recording? I did already. Okay, thank you. <laughs> sorry. Uh, that's a good point. The session is being recorded. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so this is a formal IETF meeting. So as usual, our note well applies. Uh, it means that everything we say here will be part of our permanent record and is covered by um, our process and document process related process documents, both in terms of IPR, as well as how we treat each other. Um, if you're not familiar with the note well, we do ask that you, you go uh, look at the page, the URLs on the bottom. The uh, we're using WebEx. Obviously, if you're hearing me now, you're, you have found it. And um, we are going to use the chat window for uh, queue control. If you'd like to say something, um, please use plus Q. If you want to leave before being called on, hit minus Q. If you talk, you don't have to hit, say minus Q. We'll get it <laughs> that you've already talked. Um, but it does mean if you want to re-enter the queue, you should hit plus Q again. Uh, we ask that you do practice your own mic control. We're not enforcing mic control, uh, but we can uh, if need be. Um, the blue sheet, again, is in the uh, chat. We ask that everyone join. I will note that we have 24 participants, only eight of which are on our um, uh, are on the note-taking page. So please join us there. Um, and we will also make sure that everyone who um, has signed in is reflected on the, the blue sheet, um, whether they put their name there or not. Uh, materials are in the usual place. You can also just go to our uh, data tracker page and, and get the material from there. Um, <clears throat> just a, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> just as a reminder, the focus of this interim is looking at uh, the discussion related to queuing mechanisms. We've had some uh, drafts and some requests over time to work on defining um, DETNET specific or DETNET uh, supporting queuing mechanisms. Typically, the routing area does not do that in the IETF. Typically, that uh, is done in the transport area. Uh, <clears throat> we've been coordinating with the transport area and it seems that they're uh, that they might be okay with uh, um, <clears throat> us uh, uh, undertaking this work. That said, um, it is a typical. We think that the next step for getting approved to work on this, from uh, and getting our charter modified to work on this, is and that's what it will take to do this work. Is we need a concise problem statement. So our focus today is reaching agreement that we uh, that there's a problem to be worked by the group and um, a setting a direction for what the problem is. We do not expect there to be 100% agreement today on a formal problem statement. We do hope through discussion we reach um, some verbal agreement. We expect that that agreement will be reflected in an individual draft and then we will follow the normal working group adoption process um, uh, of the problem statement to undertake this work. And as part of that, we will coordinate with our uh, AD as well as our transport area advisor, David Black, who's online. It's also the um, uh, transport area working group co-chair. Uh, so we're really focused on the problem statement. We do have some solution uh, documents on the agenda uh, and those give us sort of a preview of what the type of solutions we might under we might uh, adopt if we undertake this work. But again, the objective is to get agreement that we want to work follow this direction and have some uh, verbal agreement. I don't want to call it consensus because we do consensus on list, but some verbal agreement on what the problem is we all want to solve. 
and uh, to lay the groundwork for an updated draft or even a new draft, if that makes sense. Um, our agenda has been published. It's been unchanged since it was published. So the, the first few drafts, uh, for, so slots two, three, and four are related to problem statement. Uh, five and six are related to <clears throat> uh, solutions. And uh, we do have one other topic, which is a data independent data plane solution. It's not really focused on queuing. It's focused on <clears throat> a new data plane option for uh, debt. Um, <clears throat> we have allocated discussion time if need be. Um, we can, uh, if need be, we can um, uh, run over on the discussion, but that does mean we're going to squeeze the time or even squeeze out the later topics. But our main objective is getting the problem statement defined. So if we need more time to do that, that's what we'll focus the time on. As usual, we have an IPR process that we follow. This is just a reminder, so everyone should be uh, familiar with it at this point. Um, the, this is also a familiar slide, uh, unfortunately, at this point, you know, we're continuing to work remote and IETF 112 has been announced on being online. And with that, I'm going to turn it over, uh, to, uh, uh, Peng. Peng, uh, are you able to present? Yes, I can share. Great. Myself. Thank you so much. Uh, Can see my screen? We see it fine. It's not the presenter view, it's the other view, but it looks just fine. If you want to use it, um, I think you can proceed. Oh, sorry, let me try. Okay, how about now? Yes, we have presenter view. Thank you. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Um, hello, this is Pony from China Mobile, and it's my pleasure to talk about the requirements of large-scale uh, deterministic network. Uh, I will talk about the different levels of application requirements, some deployment data, and uh, technical requirements. Uh, okay, uh, let's start with uh, different levels of app requirements. Uh, since the deterministic network or time-sensitive network was proposed, the app use case has always been the hottest topic. Uh, it may originate from the industry, audio and video, and uh, has some uh, demand in the area of uh, 5G and industri industrial internet. The RFC deterministic network use case gives some requirements of industry uh, electricity, building, and so on. And some of them clearly uh, specify the requirements for latency and jitter, while some not for the jitter. Um, so far, when providing deterministic network service, uh, the network providers always face a problem of how to match application needs to the technology. Uh, generally speaking, new services have higher requirements on the network than before, um, but they can also uh, be classified. The one kind has critical SLAs, such as remote control of cloud PLC of manufacturing and uh, differential protection of electricity. Um, if this uh, service exceeds the boundaries of latency and jitter, it will bring the uh, property loss and uh, the security risks. Um, and there are also some relatively lower levels of SLA for consumer uh, networks, such as cloud gaming, cloud beer, and uh, online meeting. Um, users of these applications hope to have a better network service. Um, but they can tolerate it to a certain extent if the network quality is not so good sometime. Um, moreover, such users are willing to spend more money for high quality network service uh, in some aspects uh, because such service has no uh, industry barriers and uh, can tolerate exceeding the upper boundary of latency within a small probability. Uh, they have relatively lower comments for the network and uh, maybe easier to deploy. Um, and here are some deployment and uh, application status. Uh, as we know, TSN has been used in several industries and uh, that also has done a lot of work and the standards are major. Um, and the TSN has enough public awareness of the industry for its scope. 
um, for large scale or layer three networks, uh, there are also some trails. Um, here we list three. First is uh, the domestic IP on Sydney. So Sydney is the uh, China environment for network innovations, which is a, a network built for um, network technologies trail. Uh, this trail spans 3,000 kilometers and has um, 13 hopes uh, device. The data is controlled within uh, 100 uh, microseconds. And the second is the remote control cooperated with Box Steel. Uh, it's a Chinese steel company. And this trial spans uh, 600 kilometers and the latency is controlled within 4 uh, million seconds and the data is uh, within 20 microseconds. And both of the first and the second trials are related to the drought uh, queuing with uh, multiple cyclic buffers, uh, which is based on the frequency uh, synchronization. And the third one is uh, multi-flow synchronization. Uh, whose requirement is proposed by emerging uh, robot company. Uh, its two flows of video and VR were sent from um, just province and arrived at Zhejiang province together. So the people can see the synchronization of video collected by camera and the VR model. It's not a business requirement, but uh, they plan to produce the virtual industry product based on it. And due to the time and other um, problems it was realized by the edge network device for uh, relatively lower levels of SLA requirements. Um, so we can see for a uh, layer three uh, network more work for a uh, network service provider uh, to successfully sell that net type say, uh, service to customers. Um, for example, the service level objective definitions um, considering the absolute or relatively latency and JT and jitter bounds, um, flow types, and uh, physical network scale, and uh, considering more option of uh, queuing uh, mechanisms for different service level, and the deployment considerations such as uh, integration into the existing uh, networks or service. And because there are uh, many problems to consider for large scale deterministic network, it, all, it may also need to be uh, to discuss the technical requirements. Here we list five requirements, uh, some of them reference to the previous draft, uh, including tolerate a cer certain degree of time uh, variance, um, consider the transmission latency, and scalability uh, co coexist with uh, other uh, traffic and balance of cost and uh, service requirement. <clears throat> the first is tolerating uh, a certain degree of time um, variance. Uh, because of the skill of network, the accuracy and the cost need to be considered. Um, sometimes it may be um, a synchronization. Um, so for the um, time synchronization, it need to tolerate the clock, jitter and uh, wonder within a clock um, synchro synchronous domain and also should support uh, a synchronized clock uh, across domains. Uh, okay, if it's in the scope of that net, but uh, maybe it's not now, yeah. Uh, and the, if the network load of time synchronization is high or some network doesn't support uh, time synchronization, some sometimes uh, could consider the uh, frequency synchronization, um, which requires uh, uh, synchronization of adjacent device uh, in which the accuracy is also important. And the uh, IEEE QCR also has give a method without synchronization, uh, which applies to the situation not all the network device or uh, supports uh, synchronization, and also gives the formulas proof. So for the a synchronization method, it is also important to be proved bounded latency to some extent. And the second is considering the transmission uh, latency. The speed of uh, uh, optical transmission is um, <clears throat> 300 kilometers per million seconds. And due to the long distance, that is enough to generate a large uh, latency that uh, in particular, it will have an uh, impact on queuing, 
For example, if we use the time aware scheduling methods, when to open or close any gate will, uh, will be impacted by the transmission uh, latency. With the other one is scalability. Uh, it needs to support the access of a large number of network devices. And for example, to connect so many 5G based stations and uh, support a massive number of traffic flows uh, where the flow aggregation uh, may be uh, needed. And the fourth is coexisting with best effort traffic. In the view of customers, um, dedicate network is the best network service. Uh, in fact, maybe not because uh, if there are multiple um, may also have microburst, and uh, it's also related to the applications uh, um, characteristic to send or generate the flows. And uh, um, co co is coexist with uh, best effort traffic can also be an advantage of deterministic network. And um, fifth is um, balancing of cost and the service requirement. Um, whether to update all the network device is an issue concerned by operators and related to the price concerned by the customers. As showed in previous slides, some applications that requires a relative, relatively lower uh, levels of SLA may need simpler um, solution. And here are some proposed queuing uh, mechanisms beside TS and uh, in the serve um, service. Um, they are not included in uh, the draft um, that has bounded latency. And we list them and also uh, give some analysis about the levels of deterministic synchronization or not, and the cost, scalability, and the flow aggregation. Okay, first one is uh, uh, draft queuing with uh, multiple cyclic buffers, which has a relationship with uh, the draft then at a large scale, uh, and uh, it is based on frequency synchronization and multiple uh, cyclic buffers. Can be proved to provide the bounded latency and jitter. It uses the flow aggregation and the scalability is also good, I think. And the second is the microburst decrease. Uh, since it can't prove a strict bounded latency, the levels of deterministic is medium, um, but it doesn't need the synchronization and have a good scalability and can be easy, easier uh, to deploy. And the last two drafts are both based on the time step. The difference is that the former is based on uh, layer three and the later is based on uh, layer four. Uh, it is also a direction that brings the time step on package uh, based on which can adjust uh, forwarding behavior. And uh, here we list those drafts just to show there are several queuing mechanism work. Uh, as showed before, for the different requirements of application, may maybe more queuing mechanism could be um, proposed and be included in the scope of that. And uh, we also have the plan to submit a new draft based on the existing draft to and discuss the requirement of large scale network and hoping to give a reference for using the net service in the future. And uh, thanks and in comments. All right, Yakov, you are uh, first up. Okay, thank you. I'm heard. Yes. I assume people are hearing me. Okay, just uh, a comment on one of the first slides, the uh, slide about applications. Uh, these are the, th the applications you mentioned, which are uh, phase teleprotection and uh, manufacturing processes, I think are a little bit weak. I agree that the uh, uh, delay is an aspect of both of them. These are both uh, applications I know very well and uh, have worked on. Uh, first of all, phase teleprotection is uh, getting less and less uh, prevalent uh, because there are other mechanisms which are better, and it actually doesn't have a tight uh, delay bound. Uh, basically, it has a delay variation bound, but the delay itself is relatively easy to meet. It's certainly on the order of just percentages of the 50 or 60 hertz, so it's milli many milliseconds, and you can offset it. And having to do with manufacture, as long as you're, not, as you're not talking about chemical processes and laser etching and things of that sort, if you're talking about 
mechanical mechanisms moving around. Once again, we're talking about tens of milliseconds. So they're both in theory critical delay, but it's not, we're not talking about tens of microseconds. We're talking about tens of milliseconds in both cases. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, anyway, I'll consider uh, his comments. Uh, sorry, what's the uh, uh, Q mechanism here? <laughs> what's Q in the chat? Oh, in the chat, thanks. So um, I'm not sure uh, Torlis is coming plus Q, not because he's the next speaker. Okay, go ahead, Torlis. Yeah. So um, no. Just to to answer to Yakov, I think that uh, the uh, the tests done that were shown on the prior slide were also specifically not uh, on the um, on the latency, but on the jitter, right? So be, be because of the uh, queuing mechanism used. So I think that would go along with uh, what Yakov said in terms that uh, if I correctly understood him from the face teller protection that there is a uh, uh, constraint jitter requirement, whereas the latency, while well, in this case, that was, uh, you know, 500 or 1,000 um, uh, miles long um, runs, which obviously have some speed of light latency, which wouldn't be in the microseconds. I think we can go we'll go to Balaji's question. Uh, hi, Balaji, I'm speaking. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think that was very informative. Uh, could you go to the next slide, slide three, uh, which is dealing with uh, the use cases? Um, yes. so, so here I see uh, pretty good numbers regarding uh, uh, the parameters of the connection. Uh, so can, can you highlight which Netnet data plane you have used? You have used the IP data plane or the MPLS data plane during these uh, scenarios? Uh, data plan, yes, I think it's just on the IP data plan, yeah. So it was native um, IP, okay. Uh, I think the first uh, first one and second one is uh, based on the IP data plan. Um, but the last one is, is not as uh, um, uh, that a traditional network um, um, uh, network method is just to do something in the edge device. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe the next question. Uh, you have also summarized uh, the various queuing methods. So, have you used any of them uh, during these uh, scenarios, or they were just uh, some dedicated circuits for for these connections? Uh, it is um, the first one. The second one are uh, related to the uh, to this draft. The first draft uh, it's a Q mechanism uh, pro proposed by um, Huawei, and it's a frequency uh, acronization. And I think it has a relationship with uh, uh, the QF, but it's different. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the clarifications. Yeah. Okay, last question before we move to the next uh, slot, uh, Jakob. Just uh, two, two issues. Number one, to answer the uh, uh, issue of the uh, uh, delay variation rather than delay. Uh, I agree that uh, it is important in both of those uh, applications that were mentioned here. Uh, however, it begs the question, uh, once we have a long enough delay uh, and it's not really critical how much of that you can uh, absorb by simply putting a, uh, uh, a buffer of some sort, uh, as we typically used to do, for instance, in TDM pseudo wires, where once again, the timing requirements are, are extremely tight, but uh, since the delay requirement wasn't, we simply absorbed it with a buffer and had good enough timing and uh, the problem went away with relatively simple mechanisms. The other thing I wanted to mention was in there's a uh, there's several question marks having to do with SRTSN in the in the table, and I simply wanted to mention that the uh, scalability was was one of the driving forces uh, behind the SRTSN. It is highly scalable, uh, but I agree that the determinism is traded off against uh, 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 packet loss basically. Uh, so it's actually only statistically deterministic uh, in theory, but if you allow let's say one percent of packet loss or something of like that, I can. Uh, 
uh, be very similar to the, to the other mechanisms. Okay, uh, any, uh, go ahead. Uh, yes, um, uh, so, so the, the first question uh, you ask is about the, this draft or just to the uh, applications? Uh, no, I, mean, I was talking about the applications referring to what Terlis was, was, was mentioning that uh, the delay variation is the important part. Okay, 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 thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to... Uh... I quickly answer, I mean, because it, it, otherwise it would just come with my presentation, what Yaakov was just saying. Excellent, it will come with your presentation. Okay. Um, and I'll also remind that through the next two slots, we really want to focus more on problem than solution. We note that there's time for solution discussion later, including from some of the folks uh, who are speaking and have spoken already. I would ask that you hold any solution discussion until that time, you, you, uh, Torlis, you and Yakov have slots, so if you can hold off on solution discussion until then, that'd be great. And so let's move on to uh, problems with existing uh, uh, DebtNet bounded latency and queuing mechanisms. Please. Are you are you seeing a full screen presentation, please? We, we are. It looks perfect. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So this is uh, just an improved version of what uh, we I, I presented at um, uh, ITF 111, um, and I didn't have the time uh, to uh, improve on the document. I got some feedback, so thank you. Um, and um, I wanted to um, go through, I think, two sides of the problem that I see with the queuing solution, right? So one is the network and the deployment problem that we have with the queuing, and, and the other one is the application side. So um, I think uh, one big area uh, to consider for us um, midterm is, you know, how can we support the popular network designs like SRMPLS and SRV6? And maybe, you know, hey, multicast, beer and beer TE, I think I presented on that in TEAS a long time ago. So that's making progress, um, which um, have a particular property of being, um, you know, based on stateless um, and traffic steering. And then how can we support uh, large scale wide area networks with deterministic networking, which, you know, is uh, what I think uh, the good opportunity is for um, MPLS service providers, meaning MPLS wide area networks. And then, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, going to SRMPLS, SRV6. So these two things are, I think, fairly closely correlated. Of course, you know, either of these options, MPLS, SR, MPLS, and so on, they can also exist in, um, uh, you know, smaller networks like uh, campus networks or so on. But I think the focus is to be able to support large scale networks. Um, and um, that means that, you know, we, we need to figure out what the queue is, queuing is there. And obviously these networks uh, prefer to only have diff serve and no uh, controller plane um, to the uh, intermediate routers, the so-called PLSR and MPLS uh, per flow signaling, right? So that's, I think, something that uh, is typically not preferred as I think we've also seen by uh, several variations of uh, control plane signaling to the network in T's. And then um, how much should we want to have lower cost dead net options via, via no or reduced clock synchronization requirements, right? So, and I think there might be a big difference between uh, the amount of clock synchronization that you're willing to accept in um, very uh, small constraint networks, let's say like um, mobile network front hall, as opposed to larger scale networks with uh, um, wider, wider range physical links like a mobile network backhaul or uh, national networks where um, uh, clock synchronization like PTP across the whole network is uh, far from, um, I think, feasible as service provider would tell you nowadays, whereas it is accepted and used in, in the front halls, right? So, and then the applications, right? That's the, the, the jitter uh, discussion. So here was uh, my picture about um, how my imagination of the current uh, DeadNet service would be based on a, uh, per hop queuing mechanism like a UBS, the urgency-based scheduling, that's the basis um, for um, TSN asynchronous traffic shaping or um, um, somewhat modified the older IETF um, uh, int, uh, in, uh, integrated services, guaranteed service, uh, where effectively what we're having is a uh, on every hop a per flow regulator to eliminate the accumulated um, 
bursts that uh, were created on the prior hop. And so what that means is on one hand, we have uh, per hop per flow state, which is much more complicated than let's say RSVP um, steering state on a per flow basis. Um, because it is based on very accurate uh, timing of uh, packets within each flow. So um, the, um, the hardware implementation costs are something that may be, you know, fine for edge devices, um, you know, in the front hall, but not for every hop P nodes that are meant to be very cost reduced at high speeds in the terabit space uh, these days in, in a service provider network. But then even more so, um, each of these uh, flow is associated uh, with a state that needs to be updated when the flows um, CIR PRR changes or when it's created or deleted. And that obviously comes out of the controller, um, the PCE or um, admission controller, uh, what they're called. And, you know, I've been trying to summarize the key steps up there um, in the controller plane, as we call it in DeadNet. Um, and that signaling is uh, um, quite a pain. And as I try to detail in, um, in, in the associated draft uh, with this presentation, um, there is also a difference in um, how frequent um, this um, state needs to change um, and uh, who is actually uh, ultimately responsible for creating it, right? So if you have fairly traditional fixed services where RSVPTE has been used and not necessarily for queuing, but for steering, which are effectively services provisioned by the um, operator of the network itself for things like uh, least line replacement with pseudo wires or the like, um, the frequency is very low. If you're looking into, you know, user application uh, triggered uh, flow creation, you're in a totally different ballpark. And I have a long chapter on the experiences with that uh, with IP multicast, which is the only other technology I think we've seen in the past and uh, today where um, user application triggered state in transit routers is created. And let me tell you, um, service providers really hate that, uh, which is also one of the reasons why we spent, you know, the better part of the past 20 years to come up with better solutions uh, to avoid service providers having to deal with that churn in the network by the ongoing change in the control plane um, on every hop. Um, so. That's basically the problem statement. And then obviously what we would like to have is what effectively um, our SRMPLS, SRV6 networks are looking like um, from the steering side, also for the queuing side, where effectively we're using the ingress router, uh, which has all the gory um, hardware um, forwarding capabilities, include, including gates for, um, uh, you know, uh, massaging flows so that they fit the network and then um, we're basically creating a header um, for the packet um, that does the rest with the packet through the network. So far we have done that only for um, the steering part with the um, SRMPLS header or the SRV6 header um, to go through every hop that's desired by the um, controller plane. Um, but equally, we would like to have the same functionality that there is no uh, need to update um, the uh, queuing uh, for each flow across the P nodes shown in the picture. So that I think is a, a short summary of the desirable um, type of DATnet design for large scale DATnets. Obviously, it would also be fine for um, you know, even the on-campus uh, dead nets, we've seen very often that um, enterprises and other industrial players for their um, campus backbones were using uh, service provider designs because they were very often well worked out. So I think that happened in enterprises with MPLS and why shouldn't it happen for, um, you know, dead net becoming even the replacement of existing uh, campus networks when we uh, have good service provider safe um, designs. Okay, so that I think is just um, repeating what I said to the picture. Um, yep, I think we can uh, skip across that. Let's go to the application side. Um, so we, we've been starting to try to um, phrase uh, some marketing terms around um, the distinction on um, tight versus loose jitter. So if you look in on the left-hand side picture here, where we have the forwarding that we would see in um, guaranteed services or TSN ATS, where the latency to the receiver would be between the um, left-hand side red and the right-hand side left. 
uh, so red. Um, so um, the jitter is maximum, right? So you've got the fixed path propagation latency coming from the speed of light and any other um, unchangeable uh, propagation latencies within the routers. The uh, DeadNet uh, latency draft has uh, has that uh, much more fine grained, but uh, the predominant uh, part in um, smaller scale networks or the at least you know very relevant part uh, for the application problems is the jitter introduced by queuing which in an empty network when there is no competing flows would be zero and under the maximum load of all the admitted flows it would be maximum um, and uh, that's basically now your maximum path queuing jitter and that is uh, what uh, the, the following slides will show to be a problem. And then we, when we have what we call the on-time uh, scheme, then we have something where the network effectively takes care of the problem, eliminating that jitter by the appropriate queuing mechanism um, so that on the receiver side, you will only see a very small amount of jitter, you know, close to zero and um, <clears throat> That uh, then is, you know, exactly from the application side, I think uh, one of the solutions that we uh, would want to have and where only um, the cyclic queuing and forwarding uh, is included in the current um, DeadNet um, uh, latency evaluation. And that solution is very much um, uh, scale limited because it's based on um, clock synchronization as the indicator to um, how packets are transmitted. And uh, so it it uh, can only go to a range of a few kilometers for links, uh, but not beyond that. And unfortunately, I don't have a slide for that, um, but let me go on here. Okay. Right, so I think that's what I was talking to. Um, yeah, so for the application view, right? So. All deterministic applications must be prepared for any packet to arrive as late as the guaranteed bounded latency, right? So that's that's the deterministic service uh, definition, really rephrased to point out that even if packets arrive earlier, um, you know, past experience doesn't promise any future um, uh, functionality, right? So that means that you have all packets arriving very quickly because the network not load is low, but you will have written a wrong deterministic application if you now also expect that the next packets will come at exactly that low latency, you, you, right? They may immediately, you know, the next packets may come at the maximum latency, right? Um, and so uh, any um, improvements that you may get from getting lower latency are really opportunistic and that's then really a question as to what applications can benefit from that whereas um, where uh, this behavior uh, with the uh, large jitter in the network is really a problem for the application right and I think that uh, there may be some applications where it's beneficial but uh, the predominant number of applications in the deterministic space really very much benefit from having the on-time service where the network takes care of the jitter. And so um, one very good uh, background material that I'd recommend people to read is um, the application traffic profiles from the Industrial Internet Consortium um, from their time sensitive networks for flexible manufacturing testbed. Um, and that's uh, basically <clears throat> discussing the various uh, type of applications that they've analyzed from isochronous, cyclic, audio, video, um, alarm and events and other applications. And when I'm looking at uh, those different type of applications and what's being said there, I'd say that things like alarm and events where, you know, you have individual alarms and if they arrive earlier, you opportunistically can also react earlier. But for all the other applications, the on-time uh, service with um, no or very limited jitter is the most beneficial one, right? So if I um, look at my own experience, uh, media playout um, and most control loops um, want really on time. Um, any type of media playout is synchronous and obviously, yes, you can put um, buffers into the receiver applications, but you then have the requirements for the uh, necessary clock synchronization, which may or may not be feasible and the amount of buffers, right? And there have been very good uh, war stories uh, in the set-up box industry about what happened when you took 
uh, set of boxes for digital um, cable networks with a guaranteed very low jitter into uh, IPTV networks and then they wouldn't work because the buffers weren't large enough. And sure, I can build larger net uh, buffers, but the question is, do I really want to have a network service where the buffer size on the receiver equipment has to be tuned for the size of the network that I'm putting it, right? So I may be building something for a metropolitan network and then somebody says, hey, you know, now people are starting to deploy it across the country. And I say, no, I, I did basically we would have to spend uh, more money on the buffer uh, to make it work there. So that that really isn't, I think, a, a good storyline for a deterministic network service. Um, but, uh, and that was one of the things that just came to me uh, last time. If I look into the industrial applications, you know, um, by having an in-time service where the application side has to work out the jitter, um, you're moving the requirement for clock synchronization from the network if it exists there into the applications. And that is shown here on the right hand picture where you have a typical um, industrial control loop with a, a phase loop locked loop um, a programmable logic controller, which um, let's say periodically um, pulls sensor information and periodically updates actress. And if you look at the typical algorithms in these environments, then you very much uh, want to make sure that this is a quasi synchronous behavior. Um, so the um, fact that you're periodically based on a good clock in the PLC are pulling a sensor gi should give you a very good synchronous periodic um, data reading from the sensor, which you're using in your computation to also uh, very accurately periodically um, set up um, state changes in the actor. Um, and if uh, basically, for example, the um, communication to the sensor in the actor are um, uh, with with a jot of uh, jitter, then you need to have good clock synchronization into the sensor and actor to the accuracy of the control loop or higher. Um, and um, if the network really through on time delivery um, replaces that, um, then you can have very cheap sensors and actors that don't need any form of clock synchronization because they simply have to have a you know fixed reply latency for uh, the polling commands that they got, right? So that I think is from the industrial space. And I think we're seeing more and more also in the wide area network, Internet of Things, obviously we haven't seen um, any type of these designs into wide area networks because of the absence of such um, synchronous or, you know, on time um, uh, deterministic uh, service. Right, so this was my starting point attempt uh, also like in the prior presentation to come up with some criteria and vetting the different algorithms. I don't think this is conclusive right now, um, but I've been trying to highlight uh, the queuing mechanisms I think are of interest. This is not complete, obviously, um, InSERF uh, um, uh, and TS and ATS uh, being almost the same. Um, the Per hop per flow stay was uh, very nicely optimized in TS and ATS. So the interleaved regulators are um, a, a good improvement over uh, the um, uh, the shapers uh, used in um, InServe. Um, but as I've well, well, so uh, you're a bit you're a bit over, okay. and I think this okay. is maybe yeah. you know just highlighting on mm -hmm. maybe, uh, yeah. if we're going, I just highlight the criteria without yeah. going into the solution. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was just uh, saying there is a lot more detail about some of these points in the um, uh, in the paper, obviously, and um, I, that that was already the last slide, anyhow. So happy to answer questions. All right, David's first. Thank you. Actually, he's the only. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Charles wanted to ask about the first the first line on this uh, uh, on this matrix. Mm -hmm. uh, which data planes are are you envisioning using? And how much modification to each of the data planes is acceptable? In particular, um, what uh, what's your view on additional headers and or labels uh, to get the job done? Right, and I think uh, you get from the uh, 
as little change as possible, starting with MPLS. That's my second presentation because I think that's uh, the most pragmatic starting point. And then obviously, you know, I would of course love a much better QS header in general. And maybe, you know, if we through some of the other presentations uh, today come to that recognition, um, maybe, um, you know, we can bring that, for example, into the MPLS design team um, as uh, to make it more concrete. Um, and uh, I think such an MPLS header uh, would obviously be um, equally then a target for, let's say, uh, an IPv6 extension header. So, but uh, I think for the minimum mechanism that I have, the EXP would suffice. Yeah, and I guess what, what I'm asking is not so much uh, what can you do, but mm -hmm. what is what are the requirements of the actual problem being solved? In particular, how much modification and how much modification to which data planes is acceptable for what uh for for what scenarios and i don't i don't expect to have a complete answer but we're going to have to have one in order to figure out how to do work here so as i said right so the proposal later on will show it with three bits some of the three bit value of exp um if i look into other solution let's say for example um, to answer to yeah, uh, i'm sorry i'm going to cut you off here because yeah. that's that's not an answer that's not an answer to the question i asked question okay. I asked was, was 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 not a what can you do and how few bits can you get away with this is not a name that tune exercise okay. this is a what are the constraints imposed by the problems you wish to solve what are the problems uh, I don't think I understand the question sorry okay I see I okay this graph look this this chart has a bit of a solutions in search of a problem uh, flavor to it and especially for the what are you going to do the data plane i'd like to understand the constraints of the problem now even asserting some asserting some of them along the way maybe for example i think this sir discussion in the earlier slides basically asserted no new headers just you no new headers this particular subcase of the problem requires use of the diff serve field in the ip header full stop and i, I don't think I don't think that this is a, a you know answers in, in in search of a problem, right? I think that the problems are there, right? I think we do um, want to use the data planes that uh, are predominant in service providers, and uh, we need to figure out uh, how much we can use the existing schemes, like we did for pre-off as well, uh, to make um, you know the better ske uh, queuing mechanisms with lower jitter, for example, work in them. Right, and I'm and I'm looking for sort of some discussion of the problem space in terms of header modification, uh, header modification or, 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 head, or, or header introduction, because I see, I see here and in others, a lot of going in assumptions that say, that, 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 that say we're simply, we're simply gonna rule these things, these, these things out of scope and, and need to understand what the, what the considerations are that lead to ruling them out of scope. No, I don't think that header modifications are ruled out of scope. I think that uh, we, we need to weigh the pro and cons of doing header modifications, but I think we primarily need to weigh the pro and cons of different mechanisms. And if a mechanism requires, uh, you know, for the stateless operation, a certain amount of in packet information that we can't kind of hack backwardly into existing headers, let's say like L4S with the ECN bits, then yes, we're faced with the new header um, extensions. And I don't think that they're really so far out of scope, right? There is a lot of re revisiting in six men of um, extension headers. There is MPLS design teams. So I think we're on the road to um, recognizing that these things must be there if we want to evolve better services in, in the, these data planes. Okay, I I think we're headed to, towards some form of some of some violent agreement, which is that there are there are clear design trade offs in here based on how much modification you make the data plane, and we need that those need to be looked at as part of it because they strongly affect deployability. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I'd like to suggest that we just had an excellent preview of the discussion we wanted to have after the next presentation. So, mm -hmm. you know, keep those questions in mind. We had a couple of questions we were going to throw out to get the conversation started. I'll still, I'll, I'll actually put those into the um, the minutes even before. Um, and, uh, but I think, you know, this is exactly the type of question I think we need to, or discussion we need to, to have in order to determine if there is a problem here the, that the working group wants to work and what are the constraints of that problem? What are the requirements? So with that, 
we're going to move on to uh, the next presenter, J1. Okay, do you see my full screen? Yes, it looks good. Thank you. So I'll talk about uh, bounded packet delay variation. Lost the audio. I cannot hear you, Johnny. Hear you, Johnny. If I, I'm not sure if I'm the only one. Fortunately, not. He, he went quiet as soon as he started after his first. Okay, do you hear me now? Yes, I hear you now. Okay, thank you. Sorry for that. Uh, in the bounded latency uh, internet draft that's uh, gone to the to the upper level, uh, we discussed how to address bounded latency, which is defined as um, the end-to-end -end delay. So specifically, when we say that we have an upper bound on latency, we have something that is guaranteed where every packet delay is less than this thing. And a small variant of this that has been overlooked perhaps, or is not part of, of the work in this internet draft is packet delay variation, which can be defined as the difference between the worst case delay and best case delay. And it means that the difference between any two delays of any two, two packets is less than this bound. Uh, we use the word packet delay variation in the, uh, because that's the terminology that ITF uh, has been using over the years. In our work at DeadNet and the architecture RFC, we use a, a very uh, a large number of variants of that. It's called sometimes packet delay variation, sometimes latency variations. And in most presentations here, we use jitter. Uh, although the word jitter sometimes has to do also with the synchronization of clocks. So uh, we need to be careful here. I'll use the words packet delay variation. Now, DeadNet is interested in a guaranteed upper bound on latency and may And may also be interested in a guaranteed upper bound on a delay jitter. On bounded latency, we did our work uh, in the uh, in the working group draft on the bounded latency. So our work there consisted in analyzing what are the reference points, so, so what we can call a timing model, in order to compute a guaranteed upper delay bounds with all the uh, tricks that may arise when we have combinations of devices and architecture things like uh, ATS versus CBS. And uh, there are sort of things on how to add or not add uh, delays. So that was, I would say, a methodological uh, draft. And we have applied it to the queuing mechanisms that have been uh, described in the architecture document. Uh, packet delay variation in this draft is out of scope. Uh, packet delay variation, of course, is uh, subsumed by a bound on latency. If I know a bound on latency, for example, I believe for most audio uh, and video, having a bound on latency is all that is needed because it's at the end, the end-to-end -end delay that matters. But of course, the variable part also counts. But if you have a bound of latency, that also de facto becomes a bound on uh, packet delay variation. Uh, and sometimes some applications like uh, tactile internet thing, they require a very small end-to-end uh, -end, uh, latency here. But as has been discussed by Charles and, uh, uh, and others before, there may be, uh, in particular in the remote process control world, there may be applications that are require a truly very small packet delay variation, for example, one microsecond when the end-to-end -end delay is up to one millisecond. So there might be a need to specify a methodology to do what we did for bounded latency for bounded delay variation here, and to apply this to proposed mechanisms. Now, it turns out that there are mechanisms that by nature uh, provide small uh, packet delay variation. That's the, certainly the case for cyclic queuing and forwarding if the cycle time is small. And that is the, the topic of uh, many discussions. How does it scale to large networks? How to make it uh, more robust in, in front of uh, clock problems? That's one topic. But we would like also to mention that there is another device which is very similar to regulators, but much simpler, which is called damper. That is very old. The first damper proposal was in the 90s. Um, what is a damper? That's a mechanism that delays a packet by an earliness that's read from the packet header. So here we do need uh, we, we do need 
some additional data to be put in the packet header, pro probably at least eight bits plus perhaps we also want to authenticate it. So probably an additional uh, header in IPv6. And the idea is that if a queuing system, for example, on an output port is able to timestamp when a packet arrives and when it leaves, just before the packet leaves, it can write an estimate of the time spent in the device uh, by the packet and add the earliness as header. And then the next node uh, will delay a, a packet by this amount before submitting it to the queuing system. Uh, that is what is called a damper. It exists in a variety of uh, implementations or designs. Uh, making a standalone damper is, of course, a challenge because you don't want uh, to delay uh, you, you're unable, you, you don't want to build that as a standalone queuing system. So most implementations are associated with a queue similar to ATS. And in fact, there is a variant of ATS that was recently proposed uh, by Spech and his co-authors at IEEE TSN, which is doing exactly this. So head of the line damper that will delay the packet that's at the head of the queue. The major difference with the standard ATS is that this is completely stateless. So the um, the amounts to be delayed by is written in the packet header, so this is completely scalable. Um, in, in our research project, we've analyzed dampers and we realized very soon that something that's often overlooked in the context of DeckNet may matter, that's the clock accuracy. So if there is a hot debate whether we would like to have synchronized or non-synchronized networks, synchronization comes with a cost, having non-synchronized end system is certainly desirable. But even if we have synchronized networks, um, we cannot do as if the clock is perfect when we care about microsecond type of delay. So if there is some uncertainty about the timing of events. There is, for example, some uncertainty about how much time a damper delays a packet or also for a regulator, how, how a regulator uh, works is affected by clock accuracy and has been shown and it's known in IEEE TSN that we need to put safety margins into regulators to avoid stability problems of the regulators. In general, when latency bounds are order of tens of milliseconds, synchronization errors do not or clock uh, errors and timestamping errors do not significantly affect uh, the results that we have, so we can ignore them. But when we have very small uh, delays that may uh, play a role. Here's an example. That's an example of a damper deployment. That's a theoretical one. That's not one that we've done uh, in, in the field. It's done in, in a simulator where we have damper in every node. If we have dampers in every node, the nodes don't need to be synchronized because a damper is removing uh, the, the, the de all the timestamping is done locally in the same node. So the errors come only from the jitter and stability of the clocks, which is extremely small. Here, we want to remove the variable part of a backbone network that does not deploy dampers, for example, perhaps because it's only it's only using a, a EF or a very simple forwarding schemes. In that case, you need to synchronize the two timestamping at the egress and uh, entrance and exits of, of the backbone network. Those are the two only places that would need time synchronization. So if we take this example here, the dampers everywhere here in this optimistic scenario, we have also a damper at destination. In theory, a perfect damper would remove all jitters, so the removing uh, delay variation should be zero, so the end-to-end -end delay would be perfectly constant. Of course, this is not exactly possible. With realistic technological assumption, we come to a bound in this case here of 13 microsecond. If we ignore the clock accuracy, then this bound becomes uh, way smaller. So most of the uh, resulting part of this bound is due to the uh, inexactness of the clocks, even here, if they are synchronized here. Uh, dampers, as I said, are scalable. So here is to, to perhaps pursue the discussion that was initiated by uh, uh, Terrellis uh, in, in the previous talk. We have systems that, and mechanisms that are not scalable because they use per flow state and per flow queue. Those are the classical, uh, I would say, the classical solutions of the 90s. There is a hybrid, which is ATS, that is per flow state and per class queue. And then you have pure per class mechanism. If you remove ATS from TSN, you're essentially scalable because everything is per class here. And then you have, of course, a number of mechanisms that perhaps will be discussed a bit later. Uh, here I add dampers to emphasize that dampers are scalable. Uh, each of those mechanisms, of course, come with very different latency and uh, packet delay variation bounds.
An observation perhaps that is relevant in the context of this problem statement is that in practice, as far as I know, mechanisms are not unique. So we have a combination of mechanisms in any end-to-end -end system. So perhaps for TSN, we can think that we rely on a single mechanism for the whole network, but in DevNet, I believe we have to assume that there will be a set of uh, different mechanisms and a kind of mechanisms that is certainly deployable easily today is to have TSN type requirement in the local area and uh, from PE to PE nodes across a wide area backbone, then we can have uh, tunnels. So we can have a multiplexing mechanism here with probably an ATS uh, per flow, uh, per state mechanism, which is then per flow, but one flow is a tunnel, PE to PE tunnel. So unless your backbone has a huge number of PE nodes, that will uh, not be a scalability issue. So perhaps a thing to remember is that any realistic deployment will use different DevNet mechanisms that may be a very different nature. For example, a backbone might very well use only diff serve because of the trend in buffer drain time. So if we believe the recent literature, the buffer drain time is very high speed is a sub millisecond, which means probably that engineering a backbone to provide an end-to-end -end bounded latency of a few milliseconds is doable today by simple uh, statistical engineering rules. If we want a bit more, we could use diff serve. Certainly, this is not doable in the access network, so this is where sophisticated queuing mechanisms may be needed. So, in conclusion, uh, I think after reading a number of the drafts that have been proposed in, in the past three months, uh, we should perhaps uh, sort out things and separate at least two things. One is a specification of mechanisms that are addressing scalability or small bounded delay variation or other reasons from the topic of bounded delay variation itself. So can we have a methodology to compound to first agree on what we mean by this? And because the terminology is different in every uh, RFC and internet draft, and also define a methodology to make sure we can screen and compute guaranteed bounded uh, delay variation for the various mechanisms that have been proposed. Since we talk of mechanisms today, Dampers are a scalable mechanism. It's a queuing mechanism in the sense that it delays a packet. So the packets are in a queue somewhere. It's not a standalone queuing mechanism. It will always coexist with things like credit based shaper or deficit round robin or other uh, class separation mechanisms. And it is uh, available today, has been, uh, have been available for decades. So that's a well understood mechanism. And last uh, comment is if we want to embark on studying bounded delay variation, if we really care on very small bounded delay variation, then the true behavior of clocks uh, should be modeled and considered. Voila, thank you for your attention. Tordes, please go ahead with your question. I cannot cannot hear you. You are you are in the queue, or less. Yeah, thank you. I was uh, my best friend. The mute button. Uh, thank you very much. A great presentation. Um, just quick comment on the um, TSN ATS stuff uh, with, that you called hybrid. Um, I think uh, what you're referring to is that you don't have uh, per flow scheduling anymore. Um, but per class scheduling, but when you look at the realities, and I wrote that in my draft, then um, effectively the scheduling is uh, um, on, on the order of per class comma incoming interface. And so that works uh, well as a great reduction over per flow in uh, small scale switches like in um, uh, an industrial setting with maybe 12 to 24 ports. But when you get to um, aggregation switches in, let's say, um, a city, you may have up to, you know, thousands of input Ethernet interfaces. So then you may get up as, as much as 8,000 uh, scheduling entities again, uh, very close to maybe what you would be getting on the uh, per flows state. So I think that's uh, something to be uh, wary about and, and, and not lose uh, in any comparison. Okay, yeah, that, that's, that's correct. I agree. Okay, Greg, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, great presentation. Um, I wanted to clarify uh, when um, you consider uh, packet delay variation, 
uh, in um, terms of RFC 58, uh, 5481, uh, there is a difference between uh, how packet delay variation is calculated and how inter-packet delay variation is calculated. So which one uh, you consider? We considered, so, so the definition I, I gave was it's the it's a bound on the difference into any two de packet delays for any two packets of the flow. Okay, so it's sounds like neither of what is defined in 58, 5481 because um, packet delivery they are defined as a uh, difference between uh, minimum delay and any delay in the measurement. And inter-packet delay, it's... Uh, uh, well, it's the same. I mean, the bound I said, you can easily see that it's the difference between the worst-case delay and the best-case delay. Ah, okay. Okay, it's a little bit different, but okay, thank you. Yeah, it's two different ways of presenting the same thing. Okay, Johanna, uh, Johannes is the next. Uh, yeah, thanks for the great presentation and hello. Hello. Um, <laughs> good to hear you again. Uh, just, just a simple question for my clarity. You mentioned the term clocks. Do you mean with clock synchronized clocks or asynchronous clocks? Uh, so our model, uh, the, the model I, 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 we used here uh, works for both. Ah, I see. Okay. So you, we, we, in most cases with dampers, for example, you don't, or with uh, regulators, uh, you don't really need synchronized clocks. Uh, synchronized clocks will improve performance when you start having uh, drift that is uh, of the order of the synchronization error, which is typically not the case for timing, for example, uh, uh, things that concern the lifetime of a single packet in a single node. Yeah. Um, the timing error when you measure an event that lasts uh, uh, microseconds, I mean, the timing error itself is in nanoseconds. Yeah, it's, it's so quite so small, a few ppm or so. And synchronization doesn't help. Yeah. For yeah, that, I think because of the background, you know, uh, synchronization is sometimes adding complexities to a system. So it's nice to have something that doesn't necessarily rely heavily on it. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks. I also have a question, so I also would like to thank for the presentations and, uh, and your one as well, uh, Janiv, and uh, thank you for bringing in these aspects. I, I just have one more question, like <laughs> we are talking about timestamping packets on the fly, and uh, I just wonder if, if it is uh, so trivial or is there anything to consider there when we talk about large line rates of service provider networks and we are sorting out packets like is it a definite packet or is it not? And um, we need very accurate timestamping and so on and so forth. It is it is an issue, and this is why our model of tempers and the analysis we did accounted for the uh, some looseness in the timestamping. So if you want to very accurately measure that the time where an event occurs, of course that is very complex and may require dedicated hardware that has a huge cost. Now, if you're happy with more standard procedures that you have. Uh, uh, through other parts of your node, then that will affect the accuracy of your timestamps, and this is what creates at the end the residual jitter. Thank you. Todas also have a question. I just actually wanted to answer also uh, to, to to your question there. So um, PTP by itself already um, does timestamping, right? So I think we've got good experience in in interfaces up to 100 gigabits that uh, to have PTP even without any of the uh, clock synchronization involved in the timestamping. So I wouldn't consider that to be any issue. Um, the much more important issue in the dampers is obviously, you know, um, the uh, delay on the following hop, how to accurately uh, you are able to do that, because that's a very interesting scheduling issue. Yes, but that's precisely the issue that is solved by, by the damper proposals that I give in my presentation. So the, the damper proposals are, in fact, a bit like ATS. Uh, in fact, uh, JITA control ATS is an example. 
where you, you don't delay a packet per se in a buffer. You just, in the output queue, uh, in the queue of an outgoing link, for example, you just declare when packets become visible or not. So that's, that's of course, a, a different way of implementing it than a uh, standalone. Uh, and there are scalable uh, hardware implementations like RGCQ, uh, on which uh, uh, we've collaborated, that, that do that um, very efficiently, at the expense of uh, of having some granularity of the timings. Um, we've actually used most of our time for discussion already, but we haven't formally moved into the discussion on requirements. I, I, I think we, we, and problem statement, I think we really want to do that. We had one person in queue before I cut the line. Uh, Balaj, if this is uh, in a, a direct question or clarification question on the presentation, that'd be great. If not, uh, maybe um, if it's on the solution, let's wait. And uh, uh, if it's on requirements, um, uh, also hold on a moment. Uh, Balaj, you wanna go? Uh, ju just uh, one single sentence comment, and it is about to comparing PTP and data packets with timestamping. So current hardware timestamping by hardware filter out PTP and PTP is a very slow protocol. Uh, so it is completely different when you have wireline data rate packets and doing timestamping for them than doing uh, timestamping for PTP. This is just I wanted to comment, thank you. All right, great, uh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you to all the presenters who've gone so far. We um, wanted to get the discussion on uh, requirements, and really that should be requirements slash problem statement, uh, going by asking a couple of questions. The first is, um, what problems do we as a group think need to be solved? And then what are the requirements of these um, uh, problems? The, the, I think one problem that we have uh, uh, consensus on at least, or at least the speakers have had some agreement on, is um, uh, on um, control of delay variance. And that seems to be a, a consistent theme is, is that something that there's interested interest in the working group in working on? Um, if you agree, disagree, uh, now's the time to come to the mic. If you have a different problem that you think we should be working on, now is also the time to come to the mic. So with that, the mic lines are open and uh, I'll just make to note taker, please move into the next section. Uh, Torlis. Um, uh, yeah, delay variation. And I think the, the second important part is, uh, you know, large scale wide area uh, deterministic networks, you know, that we are able to support them. And as I said, I think, what we need to be able to have for them is a, um, a per hop, per flow, um, stateless um, uh, queuing model. All right, uh, Yakov, uh, I'm sorry, David. Um, would have, would, su want, would suggest to Torlis that the right thing to do is express this in terms of aggregation and uh, uh, aggregation state maintenance in uh, in the net in in the network to avoid uh, to avoid per flow state. Yeah, I think uh, you, you bring up a good point as the question of what's a flow in DetNet. We have a variable definition of flow. And I keep hearing flow, and I suspect Torless, you mean five tuple, six tuple, or per label. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, aggregation is another really uh, complex uh, uh, problem, right? Um, because that's the way we also went in uh, multicast. We had per flow, per hop state, and then service providers didn't like it, and we built aggregate state. And then obviously um, that too wasn't really a, a good fit for what the service providers wanted. And if I now look into the DeadNet issue, then obviously um, I don't want to over provision these flows, right? So if I start to build aggregates um, and I don't dynamically adjust them to what the flows require, then I'm over provisioning them. And if I do adjust them, then I still have with a per hop per flow, 
um, state building the problem that every time, you know, I put into the aggregate something more, I need to update that state and that's churn in the control plane, right? I have fewer per hop per flow um, uh, queues that I need to maintain, uh, but I do still need to maintain them at the fr same frequency. Uh, I can start to dampen the frequency by, you know, building thresholds. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff in here. I think, I think the crucial thing to take away from this is something you said uh, fairly early in that, which is that the problem statement needs to have a fairly strong grip on what the service providers want and are likely to deploy. Yeah, and I think I said that uh, before you you came up with aggregation, um, and <laughs> and that's yeah, we're, that's yes, we're, we're we're in agreement on that. Yeah. Right. So it's good to have agreement um, on that. You know, let, we should make sure it's captured that there's a, a agreement on um, the, that we want the problem statement. I, I think David summed it up. Needs a strong grip on what the service providers want, and everyone agrees on that. With that, let's move on to actually, David. Did you finish your comment? I just want to make sure I'm not skipping over anything. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Yakov. Just a, a slightly different uh, use case. Uh, what's in, what I'm most interested in. Uh, is uh, what's called X-holing, and there we actually have a latency bound uh, more than a delay variation bound, uh, and it's a uh, what I was mentioning before. It's not in the millisecond range. It can frequently be in the tens of microsecond range, and it's sort of like an absolute bound that you have to uh, uh, worry about. Um, and uh, I think that should be kept in scope. Okay, um, so bounded latency is already part of, you know, what we uh, are. So I, I, I'm trying to um, figure out how to articulate your point. So um, what you're saying, Yakov, is, is you want to make sure that whatever we come up with also supports, doesn't lose the fact that DetNet needs bounded latency. What I'm saying is that there are cases where, yes, obviously DetNet is talking about bounced latency. Uh, however, I'm saying is many of the applications people have been talking about have been bounced to latency where the bounds uh, uh, for a timing person are very, very weak. Uh, that is in the order of many, many uh, milliseconds, tens of milliseconds. And I'm saying that there are cases where the absolute latency, and you, you can't uh, uh, add buffers to get rid of this or dampers or something, uh, is in the order uh, of, let's say, an order of magnitude or two below that. Where it becomes a more challenging problem. So, yes, let's not forget the fact that there are places where you have tight latency bounds, uh, something very similar, not, not too much above the physical, uh, physically possible delay. Okay. Is it the frontal part of the network? Um, uh, it could be frontal, but there are other holes in between that and the typical backhaul. Uh, I agree that if you know 3GPP terminology, F1 is already relatively easy. The problem with F2 is normally, that is the, the front wall of uh, the ORAN group, is normally is that there are very few flows and uh, you can simply put them on a fiber by themselves. But there are things in between and there are cases where F2 also has to contend with control traffic and things of that sort. Okay, uh, thank you, Jakob. Torlis? I think I just also just wanted to the clarification how we figure out what are we still missing um, for, according to Jakob from what we have, but I guess it is uh, um, that we need to be able to combine the, you know, jitter with the um, tight, tight latency, is that it? Um. I think he's talking about yes, the tightness of the, the latency versus the tightness of the uh, latency variation. All right, that's what I heard. All right, so in the notes, I've uh, bolded the key points that I think we've hit, and in, uh, no one has disagreed with, which is control of delay variance. The problem statement needs a strong grip on what service providers want. Uh, latency bound. Uh, more than just delay variation and uh, uh, tens of microseconds range. I actually liked the uh, comment and hope it's in the notes about um, close to the hardware. Um, uh, maybe I'll just add that as a parenthetical in there. 
Are, is there any other, are there any other um, uh, problems that the group would like to uh, consider? Well, I think the question is how do we, uh, you know, um, refine what the service providers want, right? So I think in, in, in before, my opinion, Before we go there, mm -hmm. are yep. there any other problems okay. that the group would like to consider? Okay, now we've talked about problems. Uh, do we want to spend, uh, we can spend a few minutes on uh, requirements. Uh, and uh, I think David mentioned, um, you know, uh, one requirement is, uh, are we, uh, are we concerned with, um, you know, are we allowed to modify the packet header? You know, that's just one type of requirement or constraint. But there may be others. Um, another one is: Are we concerned with microsecond versus millisecond? Now, those are just some samples to get the conversation started. I see David. I think you're back in queue. Yeah, I was going to going going to wonder whether we have a set of problems that we sort of just talked through that then subdivide by class of network and that and may lead to different constraints based on what class and network you're trying you're trying to deploy this on which data plane uh things things like that um because i hear i hear pe different people using different motivating examples for uh uh to uh to to su to support the problems, and I suspect some of those motivating examples are in different types of networks. Uh, that's that's reasonable, uh, Stuart. Hello. So um, on whether we can modify the packet headers or not, I, I think it depends on what you mean by modify. But I, I don't see any of the existing packet headers capable of carrying the additional parameters that we are likely to to um, to need. So I think it's, it's inevitable that if we choose to do this piece of work, which I think we should, that we will have to carry some additional data and there's currently nowhere to put it. Now, um, how we do that is a different matter, but I, I think ruling out cha any changes to the data plane would be fatal to the whole effort. Uma? Uh, so one of the conversations uh, so that is missing is what kind of application that's being talked about for these uh, kind of requirements, right? So and uh, when I say applications, is it that is envisioned that we are going to use a TCP quick kind of thing or what kind of efforts it have on, you know, the congestion control, what happens in the transport layer to these kind of mechanisms is completely missing in earlier discussions too. Yeah, that's actually quite important of how uh, whatever we do ties into the transport layer. Uh, thank you for that point. Torless? Uh, just just to answer that, right? So the uh, uh, the Industrial Internet Consortium references I had there, I think, uh, can be of help in that. Obviously, it's limited um, to, to, to the scope of the oval applications. Um, I think what we didn't do was trying to cross-correlate this uh, discussion of bounded latency and now bounded jitter with our DeckNet use cases, um, where I think we'll also find other use cases. And then, yeah, as far as it comes to the transport layer, I think we'll have to recognize that most people who have done um, you know uh, these 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 get these, these these services in before uh, we we moved to the IETF had done their own transport right so I don't think that we have looked into that relationship with the transport layer at all right I've I've always been a fan of saying why why don't we make everything on top of RTP um, but yeah that I think is 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 an overall issue um, that uh, might even be um, going way beyond uh, this queuing issue um, you know what's what's transports for DeckNet. Thanks, Douglas. Yeah, that's very good. Okay, so uh, I've just put up a slide from the first.
presentation, which is we have, which goes back to a document we actually have, which is always good because we, you know, we work by documents. Is you know the requirements that are captured in that document. Um, there's I guess there's five of them, at least the ones the five that were shared, and I think we've identified some additional ones here, notably impact on the transport layer. That's very good. Um, is there are there other points? Uh, other than what have been made that uh, people like to have discussed related to these requirements. Uh, Peng? Oh, sorry, Janos. I guess Janos, yeah, I, put yourself. Thank, yes, I, I have a question or a comment, like uh, a large number of devices uh, it's not so specific just maybe if we can can uh, elaborate that that could be helpful like for example in in industrial automation it is uh, said that uh, chains of uh, 100 bridges or 150 is uh, typical but that's doable with tsm so is that a large scale is it a large number of devices i don't know how to refine that but uh, I, I think you're saying we need to quantify large yeah yes for example, yeah. And that may tie back to David's point about um, uh, that there might actually be different use cases we're talking about. Uh, Peng? Yeah, uh, I just want to say that um, uh, here, here we list to five requirements, but it's not all the requirements of technique uh, because uh, we also um, have some technical requirement of man management plan or country plan. And uh, I think it is uh, the key point re related to the uh, queue mechanism because uh, the most uh, uh, key issue that people care about is um, the performance and uh, the cost. So <clears throat> here, um, I think maybe uh, whether to uh, synchronization uh, is important. Uh, but I not um, also not sure the cost of um, to use synchronization on a, a large scale network. Um, some 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 people think I think it is not so much a uh, big uh, problem, but um, others also think that it it may have a, a high cost of it. Um, and uh, for the transmission uh, latency. <clears throat> It depends on um, um, where uh, or uh, where you live and uh, uh, how uh, how big your country is it. And uh, um, we also have some requirements that uh, uh, for the game you know, um, because of the errors, uh, some uh, games just to hold online, and uh, uh, sometimes it will cross the countries. So uh, it's also a key point. And, and scalability, I think, is the most important thing um, for the large scale network. Yeah, um, uh, because uh, uh, if it needs to uh, so much um, computation on the control plan or management plan, it is hard to deploy. It. Yeah, yeah, so that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, I've lost the queue. Okay, uh, Uma. Uh, so one of the requirements that should be important is like you know what is uh, required on the p nodes and the p nodes right so that uh, i think uh, some of the speakers touch based on this so for some use cases it's uh, essential that you know p nodes should not be touched so it's only pe nodes so of course that will come with constraints so it's a good requirement so one example i would say is release 16 talked about uh, uh, putting CQF like you know TSN or 3GPP network like you know complete 3GPP network from UE to uh, UPF or considered as a unsupported TSN bridge. So that kind of you know that shows that you know that can be some of the things. Of course, this comes with lim limitations. What can be done? What can be just on the edge nodes like in the TSN bridges in that case? Uh, but uh, uh, extending that to large scale networks, uh, there could be some benefits. Just focusing on the PE nodes and what benefits it can offer, it's a good requirement to take care. Okay, thank you, uh, Stuart. And uh, by the way, you, you missed me in the queue. I did? Yeah, you did. 
Uh, okay, I thought we, we uh, Trollus, then go ahead and then we'll go to Stuart. Yeah. Um, so as far as answering to these, what, 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 what scale does it mean, right? So I think, yes, in service providers in the wide area network, we have thousands of PEs. Um, we've got hundreds of P nodes. Uh, we've got link speeds of uh, terabits uh, between P and PE coming up. Um, and, um, you know, we've got, uh, then we can easily um, calculate that even if we do aggregation, um, that we may, you know, have uh, in the 10th, 20, not hundred thousands of flows uh, to be worried about. Um, and uh, yeah, and then the question, what is, what is the hardware cost that makes it feasible on low cost, you know, high speed P hardware. So I think that that's some of the qualifications for, for service provider networks and I'll leave it up to others to to discuss other networks. Oh yes, and the the other factor was the total number of interfaces in the aggregation space, right? Which can be, you know, up to a thousand Ethernet interfaces. Okay, thank you, uh, Stuart. So I, I would have thought uh, maybe I, I I was slept at the wrong time. Um, there should be performance as a requirement, because we're going to end up with a basically uh, you know the usual sort of two uh, or two by two sort of thing you know high performance uh, sort of ordinary performance versus lots of nodes versus a, a a limited number of nodes and somewhere between sort of you know flows for example somewhere between one and infinity there's a lot of space and um we need to be in the sweet spots for those spaces uh, and also in the sweet spots for the performances okay uh thank you so um I think given the conversation and that people are bringing only bringing up specific problems that they want to work on or and expanding the area of the requirements, I think the implied consensus from this meeting is that there's a problem that the group would like to work on. If anyone thinks that that is an incorrect statement, I'd like to ask you to come forward. So objections, basically objections to having the working group explore this topic. If you have an objection, please come forward. Well, that's that's really great. Um, uh, Cause it, it, it should, I mean, perhaps we only got the people interested in the topic showing up in the meeting. Um, that's why we do consensus on the list, of course. Um, but I uh, really appreciate the participation of everyone uh, to date. I know, uh, I'm sure Janos feels the same. Uh, from this point, it seems that the next step is to get us the requirements and problem statement document done. And then once we have that document, we can um, move forward on the process pieces we need to do in order to start looking at solutions. Uh, it seems that the document that Peng uh, uh, has, it seems That's like a really good uh, uh, starting point. And um, we'd like to ask anyone who would like to add to that to uh, contact the authors and work with them. Uh, I'll, I'll comment that this isn't, it's still an individual draft. So they're under no obligation to accept you know, what you say. Uh, also feel free to write your own drafts. But again, the next step for the working group is we need that problem statement. And if it comes in the form of a draft that captures requirements as well, uh, that, would be, that would be great. Um, and then from there, we can move to adoption and, and formally uh, show that this is the consensus of the group. Um, so we really appreciate, uh, again, all the contributions to this point and that we have a really good uh, starting point. Um, with that, we'd like to move on to the last three slots. We know we have a little under half an hour. Uh, we'd like to ask that each presenter limit themselves. Let's aim for nine minutes each <laughs> and um, apologize for the tightness, but we really, we've already accomplished our main goal for this meeting. So that's great. So with that, Yaakov, nine minutes. Do I have a screen up? Not yet. I don't see your side yet. It's okay. I see it now. 
Please go, go ahead. For. Okay, fine. Um, I can actually do this uh, relatively quickly because perhaps I'm barging into an open door. However, I was uh, uh, thinking to address uh, some of the problems that uh, had to do with uh, the statement uh, at the begin at the opening of this uh, uh, interim, uh, namely that uh, uh, routing doesn't normally talk about uh, queuing issues. And so I was talking about uh, what is queuing and where it has to be handled. Um, this slide was actually presented uh, once before in, in DeathNet. Uh, please excuse the fact that I'm also babysitting in parallel here, so you'll hear some noises in the background. Um, basically, what I'm saying is that a forwarder does two things, basically. Actual forwarding or switching and the scheduling uh, uh, aspect. And the scheduling aspect until now is normally done by queues. Uh, and therefore is also called queuing. However, uh, this has changed uh, both forwarding and uh, scheduling has has just okay. uh, has changed a bit. Uh, more for our point of view, TSN, once we have synchronized elements, you can instead of saying what queue to pick uh, to remove a packet from and to uh, put in the to the output, uh, you can decide more generally when you want to, the, to send any given packet. In other words, rather than looking at the queues, you can look at particular packets and schedule them. And this means uh, getting those packets out at the right time, which could mean earliest as possible, could mean close to a ideal time, uh, and that depends on the mechanism. Um, once we're talking about once we once we're talking about getting packets out at the right time. Number one, it has control plane and user plane aspects, uh, which means it's something uh, which is uh, uh, very much in what routing uh, area does. It's hop by hop. Every single router has to do one of these mechanisms, uh, certainly in some of the mechanisms we've seen, rather than end by end, um, end to end. Therefore, it's necessarily not transport area, it is routing area. Uh, and certainly, if we're talking about my proposal, which uh, uh, combines scheduling with segment routing, it's certainly something which sits in routing and therefore um, I'm, I was trying to prove in this slide something which I said before, perhaps is already agreed upon that this is not something which should be disallowed because it's uh, typically uh, TSV area uh, because uh, number one, it's not queues at all. It's not end to end and it certainly has control lane aspects. However, getting a little bit more into queues. Before you go on, I see our uh, transport area advisor has jumped in queue and so sure. we're precedence. Okay. Uh, hi, Yakov, David. You're probably pushing on an open door. However, I think you may have pushed the argument previous slide a little bit too far. I would direct people to the definition of traffic conditioning uh, in DIFF serve in RFC 2475. But I think this is in scope. And one of the reasons I think it, one of the reasons I think it's in scope is that DeadNet has a very specific service model of what we're trying to what 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 we're trying to accomplish. And the piece in the service model is very clearly in the routing area in the DeadNet working group, not in the transport area working group. Great. Okay. So I think that uh, we we agree on that. Um, the let's I just want to say a few more things about queues. Why why I call this queuing is not scheduling. Uh, and that is, what is a queue? A queue is a first in, first out uh, data uh, structure. While a, there are other data structures, this is being re relatively difficult to handle. Um, for instance, a stack, uh, a heap, or which is sometimes called a priority heap. Uh, there are all sorts of things which can be used rather than queues. And my draft uh, actually uses a stack in the packet in order to uh, uh, not have to have uh, state in the machines and make it scalable, uh, and a, either a sorted list or a uh, minimum heap uh, in the router itself, and therefore there are no queues whatsoever, and therefore I prefer using the word scheduling rather than queuing because there are absolutely no queues uh, available. Uh, I'll, I'll skip this about why we want to use something which are not queues and go directly to uh, uh, this, which is, uh, why I want to use a stack in the packet rather than something else. The stack uh, has multiple advantages. Um, certainly the fact that it's inserted is, we talked about the scalability, which is one of the requirements I just saw. Uh, it's something that can be optimized relatively simple and has very few touch points in the network. 
And therefore, when I uh, want to re-optimize, put a new flow into the network, and I think it's one of the requirements which wasn't mentioned, you want this to be dynamic. In other words, you want to be able to add a flow, remove a flow without re-optimizing everything, which is one of the problems that QBV and several other mechanisms have. And this can be done relatively simply because it only has to touch one element rather than all the switches along the flow, something that the segment routing people will understand uh, from the point of view of forwarding. Um, uh, I'd like to mention that the SRTSN draft, for those who know it, uh, don't know it very, very well, um, there are uh, simulations being done and uh, accurate calculations about what it can do, and it seems to be uh, holding its own, once again, for the case that we're, I was talking about, which is somewhat different than the, some of the other cases uh, that I've heard discussed. I'm talking about, uh, indeed, a relatively small network uh, where we're having uh, perhaps uh, 10 hops or something of that sort, rather than uh, uh, 32 or 64 hops or something of that sort. Uh, but basically that's, that's a problem of the, of the header size rather than the actual mechanism. So quickly to summarize, scheduling means today in, when we can synchronize all the elements in the network, releasing packets at the right time has nothing to do with queues. Queues actually are suboptimal for doing scheduling um, optimal scheduling uh, is obviously routing, and uh, thank you to David, and I am aware of the DiffServe work. I was somewhat involved in it at uh, some point or the other, and I understand, uh, and I'm purposely uh, doing a reducto ad absurdum, uh, perhaps. Um, and there are advantages to using a stack uh, in a packet and a uh, deadline stack in particular, and other mechanisms in the router. I think I'm under nine minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Trellis. I think it pictures this. I think you want to mute, Yako. I'm trying to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think Johannes is in the queue because. Uh... Well, if you want to ask while we're switching, we don't really have time for questions at this point. I see. Oh, can you hear me? Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. So, um, so this is basically a proposal for um, cyclic queuing and forwarding um, in large scale networks um, where um, the cyclic queuing and forwarding from TSN uh, doesn't work because of its um, uh, size limitation and also because of its uh, very strict uh, requirements against uh, synchronization by PTP between the neighboring routers. So um, the way this is solved is pretty much by having in the packet a um, uh, a tag that uh, indicates which cycle a packet belongs to so that it that information doesn't have to be recovered from uh, the uh, clock synchronization and that uh, the propagation latency doesn't have to be significantly smaller than the cycle time. Th those are the problems in CQF um, without the tagging. And so this picture kind of uh, highlights a little bit how this would work. Uh, for example, when you have three cycles and the more cycles you have, here is with four cycles, um, the more headroom you have to deal with latency in the link, with latency variation, and also with the MTIE, the uh, maximum time interval error, uh, which uh, jean uh, referred to as the clock synchronization error, right? So all these things can be accounted for uh, by using the appropriate number of cycles. And so from our experience in uh, those uh, deployment cases that were mentioned in the first uh, presentation today, um, uh, where that uh, three and four cycles seem to be fitting most cases, which kind of points us to uh, the fact that um, in the MPLS data plane, which we currently have as the core data plane of DATNET, this would be easily feasible with the EXP field, which uh, is classically used for QoS um, in um, MPLS and which Stuart always reminds me has to be called the traffic class since about now at least 10 years. So this is uh, basically a, a proposal for, um, you know, something we could standardize explicitly uh, calling out for uh, MPLS data plane uh, extension in support of tech cyclic queuing through the EXP field um, uh, of the label stack. So I don't know, I just want to give a highlight outline of what the draft covers. So um, the first section, uh, uh, number two, uh, covers how this is mapping into the classical MPL, uh, uh, MPLS data plane in um, DeadNet. 
um, insofar as that uh, it can expand all the way from the TPE on the left hand side to the TP on the right hand side and or it can be done on a subset of the forwarding hops uh, with appropriate ingress and uh, egress happening in between at the service layer. Um, and one of the good things uh, that this comes with is that um, the attack CQF can happen at the service layer and or it can happen at the transport layer. So um, the functionality is purely attached to, to the top of stack label stack entry, which you know can either be a service label or a forwarding label. Um, and so that basically all the different options that the controller plane could set up there are outlined in this section. So then the core is really trying to figure out how would you actually operationalize this? So I came up with the outline of a proposed Yang data model um, for the controller plane to use, because that seems to be the formally best way to specify the functionality that uh, this QS would have, as opposed to, you know, the informal ways of specifying Q weights and other things that we've done in the past in similar exercises. Um, and so what this basically amounts to is the fact that in each node, you effectively need to um, take the cycle of the packet that you received and map it to a cycle for the outgoing interface. And the controller plane needs to set up that cycle mapping. And to do that, um, uh, basically this model proposes uh, clock offsets, um, which the controller plane can compare. They may be read only, they may be read wide, right? So there's a wide variety of um, ways that um, the forwarding plane uh, can be flexible or can be fixed here. Um, and um, here is, um, in addition to the textual description of how it works in the forwarding plane, um, an attempt to do it in pseudocode. That's something we've been, you know, in the multicast specs in the ITF, been, I think, fairly successful with. And I feel it's, you know, a formal, um, w more formal way than the uh, than the informal text. So I think it's uh, fairly easy to to um, understand from it. This is using the variables um, that are in the Yang data model. So what really happens is on the incoming side, you're basically looking up <clears throat> the EXP of the packet that you received. Um, and if that's one of the, um, uh, sorry, the traffic class value of, of the top label that you receive, if that's one of the ones that, that's used for text cycle uh, and cycle queuing, then you remember that in the internal packet header context. Um, so this is just, you know, converting from what's on the wire to an internal representation. Then you do your normal forwarding procedure where you learn the outgoing interface. Then you may be doing additional um, uh, dead net service functions like pre-off uh, and parts of that. That's uh, more discussed in the document. And ultimately you go to the outgoing interface side where you're um, enqueuing the packet into the appropriate cycle. Um, so um, that basically simply means uh, mapping the uh, cycle internal representation to the outgoing interface um, way of, of uh, representing the cycle. And here, obviously, again, we're only talking about the uh, traffic class uh, tagging. Um, and then the packet is uh, enqueued into uh, that appropriate cycle. Um, which basically just leaves the simple um, serving the cycle queues on every outgoing interface. And that's kind of roughly presented here. Again, um, you're, you're starting a, um, a cycle um, serving um, by, by calculating your clock offsets when you start serving a cycle and then you're just for, you know, for the cycle times are serving the packets from each cycle. So all of this is uh, pretty much uh, specified here right now, really only for what we can do without changing any packet headers by using the traffic class field of MPLS. So it's a very good um, short term option for service providers uh, to, to use these. Um, constrained um, uh, jitter uh, forwarding, but the, the data model actually is set up so that we could expand it very easily uh, with other tagging mechanisms uh, in other data planes because it's just this lower part here of the data model that talks about how the packet is tagged on the wire. The rest is uh, independent of how that tagging uh, is done. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, the ingress function, which is about how to shape flows to fit into this queuing. Um, I haven't done this yet because I'm not sure if this should be in this document or if something like the gate function at the edge of the network is more generic and should be reused across different uh, uh, solutions. Um, that was the main gap uh, that, that I felt out. And obviously the Yang model itself, the complete one is much larger as you can see 
from any document that has young models. And that's it. Uh, you actually went quick enough that we do have time for a question. If anyone has any. Uh, do we want to go back to Johannes's question? Johannes, if you still want to ask it, you can. Uh, this would be great. Um, it was on the previous slides from uh, Yakov. Uh, yeah, from Yakov, exactly. So thanks for the presentation. I have a very simple question. Um, as far as I understood, you, you proposed to put um, a series of local deadlines for the path in the header. Did I got this right? Uh, so Yakov sounded to be caring for someone also on the side, so I don't know if he's still there. Yakov, are you still there? Are you able to respond? So Yakov is muted. So let's assume that he can't respond and we should take it to the list. I'm sorry, I'm back here, but take it to the list exactly. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Yakov. <laughs> I know that was a little bit of a surprise timing for you. All right, well, um, so we should uh, uh, move on to uh, Pascal then, who's our last presenter. Oh, uh, I'm not seeing my slide. Will you share them or do you want me to share them? Uh, please share them. Oops, okay, let me share. Okay, since we don't have much time, I will focus on two of the four slides. Um, first thing, the, the, this presentation doesn't look much in context with the rest, but you will see that it partly is. What it does is, is talk about the IPv6 data plane and it uh, um, basically proposes to use native IPv6 solutions as opposed to, to other ways above transport. And um, basically what the current draft does is propose uh, uh, extension headers in the form of hop by hop and destination option slash SRH to, to cover the uh, definite needs. And then you'll see that it's it's a fine match with what Yakov has been proposing and for which I've been a, a day zero fan. So we'll, we'll look at that in the second slide. So wh what do we do here? First thing is, um, as I said, we, we use IPv6 native uh, headers, so extension headers. And the first thing we do is we uh, will consider the definition of flow that uh, you, you've been discussing earlier, Lou, and saying, you know, we have different de definitions for different people. Um, what we want to do here is separate the flow, which I would call you know, compared to the water from, from the pipe. And the pipe is what we're looking at at layer three. And the pipe, the pipe is basically the path that the packet is, is following and the treatment that it's getting. And if you do that, then uh, you can easily put multiple five tuple into the same path because you don't really care what the application is when you forward. What you care is what treatment you should be giving to this packet. So basically, we, we, use a, we propose a hop by hop header to signal at each hop um, what, what the treatment will be. And that's completely independent of the transported flow. From there, we, we add um, variations of how we can signal the path information, but also the redundancy information, which is missing uh, natively in V6. So for, for the redundancy, that's how you can differentiate a copy from uh, a different packet. We we propose we can actually uh, propose different versions of doing that, so we do. And one particular uh, particular interesting way is to, to, in the case where you decide that in, in the source route header, you will specify the, the relay, so the nodes which do the service uh, sublayer, then what you can do is signal everything that is related to that in a destination option header that will not be uh, looked at by every route on the way, only the hop by hop, yes. And so basically, since in .NET we need every router to understand which path you're talking about, we, we would still encode it in the hop by hop pretty much every time, but you have the possibility to, to decide whether the redundancy information is, is natively in the hub by hub and has to be ignored by some router which just to forward it. Or if you impose that the SRH talks about the relay nodes, in which case you can place it in, in the destination option. In any case, you have a, a IPv6 native way of doing this. 
and that's pretty much what I wanted to say about this. So you you asked this question uh, earlier: Is the row specific thing? No, it's not. I mean, the proposal is really for .NET. That's why I'm doing it here. It really aims at proposing v6 native solutions for .NET needs. Yeah, you're referring back to our last meeting. I, I made that mm -hmm. comment. Yeah, the comment was based on um, the inclusion of Sixtish in uh, a, a, a number of places, and I think it would be good to separate out the um, the Sixtish part because I think it makes it a little confusing. Oh, okay. I, I would suggest just for now putting it in an appendix and say this will be put into its own document, assuming that uh, if the... Um, I think the only the only information that relates quote unquote to six stage is relating to repo is because one of the variation of this hub by half, the path information, <clears throat> there are multiple ways of doing that. And one of them is already in use uh, in the real world. And uh, that's used by repos or millions of repo nodes deployed, and they effectively do it this way. So you have you have the path information which is encoded in the hop by hop header. So so I just mention it, but I don't need to specify anything new because it's just mentioning that's already done. If you want me to push that to to Appendix, I can. So it, I I don't think we can have a base spec that has any uh, musts in it that relate to. Uh, oh. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. that. There will not be, I mean, okay, this is talk, talking about something which is already there and already mastered in, in those aspects. Okay, uh, I just saw that you have a, I mean, it's a really small section. I think it's it's a really, it's not the key to the discussion. And I think no, you know, we don't have to spend time on it. I mean, if, if I was to erase it completely, I wouldn't mind at all. It's just to, to, to put things yeah, in perspective it, and it, show that it's been done and it's completely doable. Well, if it's informational, make it informational. Right now, it has a must in it, so it seems. Okay, like okay, okay, okay. I, I see that, Lou. I'm taking that that argument. Yeah. So um, that that that's a minor. That's yeah. that's what caused me to say is this really focused on mm -hmm. uh, raw? Uh, okay. So I think the next step is to uh, get feedback from the group on interest in this. I see that uh, I can't tell on timing, but I believe we have two people in queue, so maybe we'll get that. We have Torlis and uh, Balaj, so why don't we uh, get those questions answered and mm -hmm. uh, go from there. I do note that we're coming up on the hour, and I know some of us have a hard stop at the top of the hour. So Torlis, you're up. I think uh, the uh, I think the certain certainly native IPv6 is 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 fine. I think the the main issue um, that um, maybe we haven't captured correctly was the um the the way i understand it jan uh, the uh, yakov's proposal which which this is related to um yes. I, I i haven't um i don't have a clear indication whether there are simple um standardizable um latency calculation models for this based on what actual queuing you're doing in a particular node, right? The way I understood it from Yakov, there are a lot of different ways on how you can uh, implement this. And depending on what you're doing, your controller plane would have to do different calculations, right? So I think what I'm worried about is to uh, whether we're able to have um, a standardized expression of uh, the way that the queuing system on particular implementations will work so that the controller plane can build an interoperable um, uh, uh, system across them. If you use SRH, I mean, maybe Yakov should, should answer, but if you use SRH, basically the goal would be <clears throat> for those nodes that you, you put in the SRH to encode uh, basically a target date or something by which they need to leave this node. So and, right, no, no. The the point is when you have the uh, the, the the timeouts or uh, the the latencies for every hop that you're indicating there. The question is how does the queuing uh, with or the scheduling within the router react on that, right? So and 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 Yakov was explaining me a bunch of different things that could be done there. Um, and the question is, could we standardize them or would we leave a much more um, you know, a, a different type of, of, of uh, latency control system to the operator where um, it's not quite clear to me how, how well the latency calculations can be standardized. I, I'd like to take the follow up to that to the list and let the last question. Oh, uh, Balaj, I was giving you time to ask your question. He just removed himself to the queue so you can continue. You have about uh, 90 seconds. So, Torlis and uh, 
No, no, that's that's fine, and I think it's better to take it to the list uh, for follow-up. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah, I'm not the one to answer this right now. I mean, I've been thinking about this on my own. I mean, I was following a path parallel to Yakov some years ago, uh, and and actually, I need to mention that there is already a, an RFC uh, in IoT which gives a deadline um, as part of those headers, but only a deadline. I mean, if this packet has reached destination by this time, drop it. But here, and I tried to to have the, the guy who did that provide a schedule for multiple hops, but they never did in their drops. So what's the RFC number? What's the RFC number? It's it's called deadline at six low. Let me look. I mean, okay, that's know. fine. De uh, so deadline at six low. Uh, right. So, but I think to get back to what Yakov uh, said earlier in the call, it his uh, uh, solution was uh, stochastical and uh, would accept 1% loss of late packets. So I think that's an interesting question, I think, for the scope of what we want to work about. If, if that's something we feel is uh, deterministic enough to be called deterministic networking, because I think uh, when I had the same discussion with Norm Finn or so years in the past, he was very adamant against that. I don't have any strong opinions. Okay, so uh, and if you... uh, we are now at the end of the meeting. Okay. Uh, look forward to more discussion on the list. Again, we achieved our main objective earlier, which is to uh, see that we do have interest in working this problem. We're going to continue seeing it worked in uh, the draft that was presented first. And if there's a, and hopefully we get some additional input from the rest of the working group, either on lists privately or in their own drafts. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, contributing and a uh, very interesting topic. Appreciate everyone's time. Thank you.